Welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner, I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I'm really excited about this class because we get to dive into, as Tom likes to tell us, nuts and bolts of how the courts work. So Tom is our, one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center, and he's gonna walk us through the history, but actually the practical workings of the court and what they do and how they do it. So Tom, what's kind of like a big kind of goal you want the students to be able to walk away with about understanding the courts? Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the courts sometimes can be an, an intimidating part of the government and for a lot of people, a mysterious part of the government. And so hopefully what we can do today is give some sense of you know what it is, why we have a Supreme Court, why we have a federal court system, but also just how it works. How if you're an active citizen interested in what's happening at the Supreme Court, how can you kind of track what's going on and cut through some of the legal jargon, the legalese, and really just see practically what's happening inside the courts? And I love it because you're right. The courts seem to be a mystery. They seem very, I mean, look at the building behind me. It's grand. <laughs> it's, it's intense. That's awesome. That's great. But it's also, it feels a little like you can't enter it. And you can enter the courts. And there's a lot that you can know about the people, the real people that live in the courts um, and do the work there and the history of it. So let's start off with a base question for our students. This is an easy 101 question. <laughs> students, in the chat, can you name how many justices are on the Supreme Court? Because we're going to start with who they are and walk through who they are, when they got on the courts, all those pieces. So Cunningham class and Riley's got some guesses in the chat already. How many we have right now? Clarify. <laughs> we'll give you one more minute to guess. Nice job. Okay, they're all getting it. Nine, nine members of the court. Here is what we lovingly call our class photo or what we were talking about earlier this week. It's like the Sears family photo of the court. <laughs> they're all together. They're standing in certain spots depending on how they're set up. Um, Tom, walk us through who they are and why they're standing in this order. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, the, 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 the photographer here is constrained. They can't just tell the justices to stand in a, is a certain spot. The justices are situated there by seniority. And so right there at the absolute center of the picture, number one, you see uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, who was appointed by George W. Bush. Um, and then, so he gets to be at the center. The Chief Justice is always the senior justice. So a chief, new Chief Justice could end up being selected and, and, and confirmed tomorrow. They would immediately become the most senior justice on the court. But then sort of ticking through the rest, Curry, we see there number two is Justice Clarence Thomas, who was added to the court by George Herbert Walker Bush. And then if you go to the next side, number three there is Justice Stephen Breyer, our guest next Friday for our Friday class, uh, who was a nominee of uh, President Bill Clinton. Number four then, if you go on the bottom row there, is Justice Samuel Alito, uh, another nominee of George W. Bush. And then all the way on the other side there, number five is Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who was appointed by President Obama. And then if you then go to the top row, number six there near the middle, is Justice Elena Kagan, also uh, nominated by President Obama. Number seven, next to her is the very tall Justice Neil Gorsuch, uh, who was uh, appointed by uh, Donald, uh, President, uh, President Trump. And then number eight there at the, at the row there is uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, also uh, nominated by President Trump. And then finally, our, our newest justice there, number nine, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, also nominated by President Trump. One interesting thing is, so one thing about the Supreme Court is so much of it is, uh, you know, the Supreme Court develops customs over time, norms over experience, you know, over time, different rules that they establish themselves. One of them is when they meet in their private conference each week, it's in secret. The justices are the only people allowed in the room, but if someone knocks on the conference room door, it's actually the task of the most junior justice to get up and answer the door. So that'll be Justice Amy Coney Barrett now, but Justice Breyer was the junior justice for 12 years. And so he was stuck getting up and answering the door for 12 years in the justices private conference. There's a lot of tradition in here and set up in a way. I love that story, Tom. It makes me laugh so hard. And I feel like Justice, we might have to ask Justice Breyer about that on Friday uh, when he comes on the 28th. But it feels like there's a lot of tradition. What other, how do the numbers and the seniority, how does it play out when the cases are heard and when the cases are um, finalized? Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's an interesting question, Curry. So what, let's sort of take it in, in, let's take it in the context of the Supreme Court has 
to, uh, you know, let's just let, let's, let's go to the conference. And so one thing is that seniority is going to determine how conferences work. So what do the justices do at their conferences? Well, one, they decide which cases to take. So they have a bunch of what are called petitions from various people saying, Supreme Court, take my case. And so the justices in conference, they've already read these petitions. These is filing for cert right there exactly. And so in conference, they're deciding, do we take this case? Do we not take this case? And it takes four justices, not a majority, but four justices to decide to take a case. That's the rule of four. That's how the court determines whether or not they're gonna take a case. That's actually a function of a law that was passed by Congress. So in 1925, they passed a judge's bill. It was pushed by Chief Justice William Howard Taft, the former president saying, you know, we really should have control over which cases we're taking. And so the Congress said, yes, that's right. It used to be the case. We've required you to take so many cases. We're actually gonna let you decide which cases. And so that's one thing they're doing in conferences, deciding which, which cases to take. But seniority really comes in when the justices are in conference discussing cases that have already been taken, cases that have been argued before the court. And so they're doing this each week during times in which there's oral argument that runs from October through early April. They're having oral argument the first two weeks of each of those months usually. And so they're meeting each week discussing what happened in oral argument. And when they do that, the justices enter the room they all shake hands. So that's another custom, a sign of respect for one another. And then they proceed by seniority to discuss the case. And so it begins with the chief justice, then it'll go to Clarence Thomas, Stephen Breyer, and onward. And then what's so interesting, we've heard Justice Breyer talk about this in the past, is there's just there's a custom there. Everyone gets to say their piece in seniority order set by custom, and no one gets to speak twice until everyone has spoken once. And so everyone's able to speak in an uninterrupted way about how they analyze the case, how they see it, the questions they have, and then eventually how they plan on voting. And so with that, they get an initial tally of how the court's going to decide the case. And then the most senior justice in the majority determines who's going to write the majority opinion. So if the chief justice is in the majority, the chief justice is going to assign who's writing the majority opinion. So that's one of the, there's not a lot of formal power in being the chief justice, but that's one of the powers is deciding who's going to speak for the court in a given case. If the chief justice isn't in the majority, then the most senior justice, say, say Chief Justice Roberts has dissented and Justice Clarence Thomas is in the majority. He is then the senior justice and he's the one who's going to decide who's going to write the majority opinion. Sort of similarly, Curry, the justices also, if they disagree with the majority opinion, they can get together and write a dissenting opinion. So sort of explaining why they disagree and why they think the case should come out a different way. And there, again, if there's multiple justices, the most senior justice will often coordinate who's going to write the primary dissent. And then finally, even if you agree with the majority, but you have other thoughts on how to analyze the case, you can write what's called a concurring opinion. You see a lot of those, especially in sort of the more high profile, difficult, sometimes controversial cases. And I love kind of like exposing and talking about all these words about how the cases are almost like these are the major ones and these are the sub sets of the opinion or the scent. Um, now, is it true that sometimes judges, like, so if Clarence Thomas is the justice that um, is next to write it, they can hand it over to somebody else. Um, and I remember this great story by Justice Ginsburg where she shared how um, Justice O'Connor gave her almost like her first big break at writing a case. And it was a major case. It was Justice O'Connor's turn. And Justice O'Connor looked at Ginsburg and said, you know what, it's your turn and handed it over to her using that seniority. But is this, is there a way that they typically do this? Um, what is kind of the, the custom around who writes it and who they hand it over to to write in order? Yeah, there are a couple of different things that factor in one. And it was surprising to me uh, when I, you know, when I began following the court professionally and closely is that there is a strong tradition of roughly giving each people the same, each person the same number of majority opinions each term. And this even happens, you can look sitting by sitting. So month by month, the court tries to give sort of a, an equal distribution across the justices. So we may think, well, there may, you know, if it's a, you know, you know, the, the best justice or whatever might get the most or whatever, but really the court sees to it that the opinions are distributed fairly evenly. There have been times in the past actually where chief justices, there are certain justices that are slow. And so they would then penalize other justices, giving them fewer opinions to try to get them to speed up. So there's some of that, but mostly it's an equal distribution over time. When you're deciding who's going to decide, who's going to actually write an opinion, there are a couple of different things that come to mind. You know, the chief justice sometimes, if there is a really high profile case where the chief justice may think that maybe the, 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 the prestige of his position 
um, can help bring, bring some, some authority to what the court's saying. Maybe the chief justice may take that opinion, or maybe it's the case that's a really closely divided case. It's five to four. And you know that there's one justice that was kind of going one way or the other. Maybe you give that justice the opinion and allow them to do it because that way they can sort of set what they're comfortable doing and you can go, you can move from there. There's less of, there's probably, it's less likely that justice may go to the other side. And so there's some strategy involved in who you're giving opinions. But I think the one take home point, Curry, that really gives you a sense of how the court works though, is this idea that they do pretty much distribute the opinions equally. And so everyone can, they're not to say like, everyone gets a, an equal number of important opinions, say, from as we look at them as blockbusters, but that at least the same, roughly the same number of opinions. There, it always feels, and I know Justice Breyer has talked about this before, but it always feels like they have such a great setup for civil discourse and dialogue and fairness within their structure. Um, and you're right, collegiality, like good, being good team members. And that brings me to my next question. And Tom, I'm making you zigzag around because I want to make sure all the kids you know, understand how the courts work and the people behind the robes. Um, the Chief Justice, somebody asked on Monday, I thought it was a great question, is the Chief Justice, if, you know, the Chief Justice leaves, is it seniority that replaces the Chief Justice or can that person come from, you know, from the field, from somewhere else? And what is the, the role of that position? Because it is special and different and it is really like that center point around the whole court. Yeah, it's the president's decision. So like most of the time they select someone from outside the court. That's almost, that, that's not, that's, that's been the, 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 the most common approach. But there have been times in which presidents have elevated sitting justices. So uh, President Reagan uh, elevated Justice Rehnquist to become Chief Justice Rehnquist. Um, earlier in the 20th century, uh, Edward White was uh, elevated from justice to Chief Justice. So it happens. Uh, but generally speaking, the, 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 the president will usually select someone from outside and you specifically know that person is being selected as chief justice. And actually Chief Justice Roberts, if I recall, was initially selected for the vacancy created by Justice O'Connor. Um, and so he was going to be an associate justice. But then when uh, Justice Rehnquist's seat opened as well, President Bush then said, no, 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 Chief Justice Roberts is going to be the, I'm designating that person as the chief justice and Justice Samuel Alito is going to be an associate justice. Now the question is, how do you choose one versus the other? You know, it's, it's hard to say. I, I, I think the common sense approach is that the thought is that the, the chief justice is also going to have, a, you know, a, a, a sort of a great deal of responsibility for the overall operations of the federal court system. So the chief justice is also overseeing what's called the judicial conference, which does all sorts of other things like creating rules of procedure within the courts. So they oversee a lot of that. But also, I think there's always a sense that the chief justice is also takes on a special responsibility to speak for the court as an institution. Um, and so you often see that across time as well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think it was a fascinating question and one that, you know, you could just kind of assume it's just the next person in the row, but it's not really, it's not the norm. Um, so I wanted to like weave it in. So two more questions as we kind of go through this. And, you know, one of the base ones is what is the job of the courts, especially the Supreme Court, what is their role and their job in the constitutional balance of structures? And then two, what about the lower courts? How do they, how are they a part of this? So we can jump to article three if you want, if that's helpful, because that's where it is in the constitution or anywhere you really want to go. Yeah, let's start with article three and talk a little bit about sort of the, the roles very large. And then we could talk about the different level of courts. And maybe as we do that, we could talk about, so how, and really, what is the rule Goldberg to get a case from the lower courts to the Supreme yes. Court? Um, so yeah, Article Three. I think the big things to remember about what Article Three is doing. So one, it's establishing a separate branch of government, and so we're creating the judicial branch. It's vested with the judicial power, and so with this, the judiciary is going to interpret the law. So that's a key part of it. It's this new function. If you remember, under the Articles of Confederation, there was no separate federal judiciary. So with the new Constitution, we're setting up this new separate federal judiciary. That's one. Two is that we are writing into the Constitution one key principle, which is judicial independence. And so if you go back for the founding generation, one of the things that they really criticized about the British Empire was that their judges were not independent of the king. They weren't independent of the government. They could be removed at any time. The, the, the king, parliament could take away their salaries. And so they really had pressure to do the bidding of the political branches. And so with Article 3 here, we see that, that language there that the judges, the federal judges shall hold their offices during good behavior, which there, what that generally means is that a, a federal judge, including a Supreme Court justice, 
they're going to hold their office until they choose to resign, they pass away, or they're impeached and removed, which for a Supreme Court justice, no Supreme Court justice has ever been removed through that process. So we're really talking about people can serve for decades upon decades on both the lower federal courts and on the Supreme Court. The last thing here, Curry, and this really, I didn't think about it much until I went to law school, is that there's also a compromise struck at the convention. So one thing to think about the federal judiciary is that at the constitutional convention, the, the delegates didn't talk very much about the courts. They didn't talk a lot about the judicial branch. They had a lot, a lot of other stuff to do. And so they struck a compromise here in Article 3 that you see in Section 1, which is that there's going to be a Supreme Court. And that's about all we're going to settle. Most everything else we're going to leave to Congress. And so it ends up being the first Congress's task to set how many justices there are. That's not the Constitution. That's set by Congress. You know, whether and how many lower federal courts they're going to be, they created an entire level of federal district courts, the first Congress. And so over time, Congress has a lot of say as to how many different levels of federal courts there's going to be, how many judges, and then how many justices on the Supreme Court. I love everyone, you know, got the nine justices of today, but the number of justices of has varied from 10, uh, from all the way up to 10 to all the way down to five. I mean, we haven't changed it in 152 years, but if you think about during the Civil War and Reconstruction, there was a lot of change. During Lincoln's presidency, they added a seat for Lincoln to get to 10. And then they took two away when Andrew Johnson became president, so he couldn't fill those seats. And then they put one back in place when President Grant won the presidency. And that's how we're stuck at nine. So it's just, it's interesting to think about how a lot of those details, not in the Constitution, but actually decided by Congress. And I love that like separation of powers too, that Congress has the power to look at that. And then it was FDR that tried to expand that again, correct? Yes. Yeah. But I mean, the one thing to note, Curry, is we always talk about court packing. There are, there are examples of court shrinking as well, which, again, we saw mm -hmm. while President Johnson was president uh, uh, during Reconstruction. Yeah, there's two ways, two ways to go at it. <laughs> you yeah. can make it bigger or you can make it smaller. Riley asked a really good question. When they are looking for a chief justice, does anybody, you know, it is a great question because, you know, you would, does anybody weigh in and ask the other justices almost what they need or, or what kind of like leader that they would want? Because you think about it like on a team and when you hire somebody new, especially a new leader, you might ask the team members, like, what are we really missing here? What's somebody that's gonna move us forward? Is, do you think there's any consult between the president and the um, sitting justices? You know, that's varied over time. I don't, I think it's against, you would say probably that's against the norm of today. I'm not gonna say it doesn't happen. I'm not quite sure, but it was real. So like I study reconstruction in the reconstruction court it was quite common for not just for the chief justice selection, but for new justices, for the president to talk to sitting justices and say, what do you think about this nominee? And also sometimes, and we don't even think about this really, like, are there areas of law where you're looking for expertise? So like, I remember there was a point in time where like the justices were like, we want someone who has a knowledge of the law of the seas, you know, laws, what's happening on water and international. And so like, oh, Samuel Blatchford, that's a great choice. So it's, you know, this, this, this happens over time, but today, not so much, but you would, you know, it doesn't, that's not a, that's, a, that's an interesting question because you would think that part of it, you know, what you're looking for at a practical level sometimes is just the chief justice is also the person who's sort of setting the guidelines at conference. And so that's varied over time. Under Chief Justice Berger, those conferences were said to run on and on and on and weren't particularly well organized and, and were rambling. And then when Chief Justice Rehnquist took over, he ran a really tight ship. And so even that for the justices really, and he was very popular for that reason. So even that for the justices is sort of an important consideration. Yeah, and I always think of like uh, Lincoln's team of rivals, like looking at his cabinet, he went different skill sets so they could all work together or kind of push each other through. And same with Washington did the same thing. So I think it was a great question, Riley. Thanks for asking. Um, now, did we clarify for the students what's the key job of the Supreme Court? So yeah, the key job here, we would say the Supreme Court's, the judiciary as at large is there to interpret the laws. The Supreme Court and the federal courts, you know, a key thing to think about is that they also have the power of judicial review. And so this is not specifically spelled out in the constitution, but it's a power that the federal courts have. And that simply means that the federal courts and most notably the Supreme Court at the top have the power to look at a law and say whether it's constitutional or unconstitutional. And so, you know, that ends up being a key responsibility. And why? So, you know, that, that's sort of like the, the, the big power that the courts have. But why did the founding generation think it was important to have this federal court system? We didn't have in the articles. Why did we add it to the Constitution then? And there were certain things they were looking for. You know, one thing is that they wanted to have federal courts and especially a Supreme Court 
to be there in cases where you might have conflicts between one state and another. That might be one where you want the, that the federal courts and the Supreme Court to be a referee. Similarly, if you have sort of conflicts between either a state and an individual and a foreign country, you might also want a national court system that's gonna speak for the country. And then finally, you might also want the federal court system there to promote a, a unified vision of the constitution and national law. So with that, making sure that the constitution and laws passed by Congress are applied the same way in different states. Also be able to step in if states are passing laws that run up against the constitution or national laws, that the national courts, the Supreme Court can step in and say no. And then finally with Congress, Congress is, you know, with the Constitution, we created a Congress that was one that was more powerful than the previous government, but one of limited powers. And so part also of what the Supreme Court's doing in that circumstance is to make sure Congress is continuing to stay within the powers set by the Constitution. And with all of this, Curry, in the backdrop, and we see this increasingly over time, is that the courts also are often a venue where groups that are, 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 are not, do not have political power, that are numerical minorities, they can go there and say, no, 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 we may not be able to win a majority in the elected branches, but we have constitutional rights and this is where we can vindicate them. And so we've seen that as a role over time, the courts also being protectors of minority rights. Hmm. Fascinating way to kind of think of that, not having enough people to change the power of representation but the law through the courts. I love it. I love that. So Riley asked a really good question. It goes exactly to what you were just teaching us. When we think of the Supreme Court, we think of them as, I always in my head think of them like parents or like your adults. And like you have a, a conflict between you and somebody else. So it could be your teacher, could be your parent, could be your grandparent. And you're in conflict with each other. So state to state, you go to the court and they are the arbitrary. They say, work it out amongst yourselves or they dive in and say, this is how we're going to do it. What happens or has it ever happened that they've been an even number and come in the conflict with each other and did a split like a four, four. Um, oh yeah. And we've, yeah, we've, I mean, we've seen that in recent years with uh, the, the vacancy created by justice Scalia. We had an eight justice court for several months. And so what you saw was actually a certain number of blockbuster cases, the Supreme court justices decided narrower rulings than they may have otherwise. So they wouldn't divide evenly. Um, but there were a certain number of cases, one dealing with the environment, another with immigration, another with the First Amendment, where they split four to four. And what happens there is effectively there's no decision at the Supreme Court and the lower court decision stands. And so there's no new precedent involved there. Um, uh, but, you know, it just ends up effectively whatever happened below um, is, 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 is said. The last thing the court could do um, in that circumstance is to hold over the case until they have a full court. So sometimes, you know, they, they, they have, again, the Supreme Court has a great deal of power to do what it wants. It has a lot of flexibility. So sometimes it could do that as well. I was like, put pause. That's interesting. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think I ever realized that they could hit pause on a case and we'll, we'll listen to that now. Yeah, there's no, there, you know, I, I joked about, you know, at the beginning, then why, why do all these cases come down in June? It's because, you know, that's where the deadline is. They want to get their, their papers in on time. But, you know, that's a matter of tradition. There is no actual deadline for these cases to be decided. Um, and so the justices, again, they have some flexibility. It's just as a matter of custom of tradition now, the justices will almost always finish all of their work by the end of June. We saw last, last year because of the pandemic, it went into early July, but really just a little bit into July. They really get done there. Um, uh, so they have, have, you know, so they will do various other things over the summer. Awesome. Now let's do the Rube Goldberg because it isn't just a straight shot up between these lower courts to the higher court. It's kind of a could be a total zigzag as well. So how would a case kind of move through these la layers of the court system and what are the layers of the court system? Yeah, so there's three layers to the federal court system. Again, remember, these are set by Congress. They're set by laws passed by Congress. And so that first set of, 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 of uh, courts there is the, the lowest level is the district courts. This is where you'll have usually just a single federal judge hearing a case. Um, and so it could be, you know, jury trial, it could be a bench trial, but that's where the vast majority of cases begin and the vast, vast, vast majority of them end. You know, it, it, there's just a ton of work that's done there. How do you get in the federal courthouse to begin with? Well, there has to be a, either a conflict between people from different states. So that's one thing is the thought was we want federal courts to make sure that people in different states continue to get along. The other is if there's a question under national law. So this could be under the Constitution or by a law passed by Congress or a federal regulation. So that's how you get in. That's the district court. And someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. And so what's the next part? Well, if you're the loser, you have a right to appeal. 
And so you can appeal to this next le level of court, the, the circuit courts of appeals. There are 12 geographic courts of appeals throughout the country. Um, and so unlike the Supreme Court, these courts of appeals, if they get an appeal from the district court, they have to decide it. They don't have control over which cases they take. They have to decide it. And they can decide it very quickly. A lot of the appeals coming from the district courts are really well established based on precedent. And they can get rid of, you know, they can sort of uh, decide those cases very quickly, but they have to decide them. So again, here, usually the way it's going to happen is you'll have a panel of three circuit court judges deciding a case. It's majority rules. And then there's one other attempt. You know, if you lose at that level, you can say, I want all of the, the judges on this court of appeals to decide my case. It's called en banc. And then you could have the entire circuit here. But that is rare. But regardless, the party that loses then in the circuit court of appeals then has a choice to make. They can decide whether or not they want to file a, a petition to the Supreme Court asking them to review their case. This is known as a petition of certiorari. And again, the Supreme Court then, because of this 1925 judges bill, has control over deciding whether or not to take that case. They could say yes or no. There are roughly 10,000 petitions each year before the wow. Supreme Court coming from those circuit courts of appeals. You know, these days they're deciding, uh, you know, 63 cases, like not many. So almost every, every, almost every petition is denied. And so this is, again, just to emphasize so much of the action and what's important and what affects people's daily lives is happening in the circuit courts of appeals and the district courts. Um, but the Supreme Court, so how do they decide those 60 or so cases they're going to take each term? The most important criteria they have, the most important factor they look at is are there disagreements in the lower courts? Because they see their duty, their duty is not to correct every mistake in the lower courts. They couldn't, there's so many cases down there. It's not even to decide every important issue in the lower courts. More than anything, they're looking to ensure that the constitution and national laws are applied uniformly across the United States. So they wait often and to see how different circuit courts of appeal are going to address a new constitutional issue. And when there's conflict in how they address them, they will take that case. They will, of course, sometimes it'll just be a really important issue and they will take it on that criteria too. But it's, it's impossible to overstate how much of this really turns on what's called circuit splits. The idea that lower courts are coming out differently and the Supreme Court is weighing in to make sure the, the laws apply uniformly everywhere. I love circuit splits. It sounds like a really good milkshake, but it's also a fascinating thing to watch. Um, now, the students, the piece that they really wanna know next is who gets to be on the Supreme Court? So, and I know this like has been an interesting thing to look at who's on the Supreme Court and what their qualifications are for the job. Um, but really, what do we know about who can be on the Supreme Court? Anyone. Yeah. You know, it's it's, so it's like the Constitution. Again, we've talked, I talked about it with Article 3, but there are no set qualifications. There's no age limit. There's no requirement that you be a lawyer. There's like, there's nothing. It's all set by what criteria the president sets and then what the Senate is willing to accept. Because here's the key language, the president shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. That's all we know from the constitution itself. The president nominates and the Senate says yes or no. And the way that the, that the president and the Senate have you know, sort of done this task over time has evolved. And so now we have a tradition where, you know, often the president is going to you know, talk to a lot of people. He has his own lawyers on staff vetting different nominees. Usually now the nominees are going to be uh, one, yes, they will be lawyers, but two, most of them now are judges. That wasn't always true. They used to be a lot more politicians on the court than there are today. Um, but now it's usually judges. And then usually whoever the president selects will then have hearings before the Senate Judiciary Committee. So this is a group of senators tasked with vetting these Supreme Court nominees. It's true of the lower court judges too, but these are those high profile hearings you see on C-SPAN and on cable news and all of that. Um, and so what they do there is the senators get to ask the Supreme Court nominees questions. But again, this isn't the way we did it through a lot of our history. Um, you know, I think it was the first uh, Supreme Court nomination hearing was after Woodrow Wilson uh, nominated Louis Brandeis, but Brandeis himself didn't testify before that, that particular hearing. I think the first, uh, nominee to testify was Felix Frankfurter in 1939, um, the nominee of uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, so yeah, so this is varied over time. And so you have these hearings at the Senate Judiciary Committee. The Senate Judiciary Committee then votes to either recommend the nominee a yes or say no. Then the nomination goes to the full Senate and the Senate votes yes or no. And it's a, these days now, because they've gotten rid of the filibuster in that situation, it's a simple majority. 
Fascinating. Okay, we have like one minute left. Um, the students and I, I shared the SCOTUS blog uh, link, but I'll share it again. What, you know, it's, it's like the Super Bowl at the, in June, the big cases come out. So two big cases that are speech, I mean, not speech, First Amendment cases are Fulton and Mahoney. And I thought the students might be interested in these two to be able to follow along and see what happens in the next six weeks. So can you give them a real quick snapshot of these cases? And then in the um, chat, I will put where you can find the outcomes. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So these are two, two important cases. The first case, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, is a First Amendment free exercise challenge. So it has to do with how the court's going to read the religion clauses of the First Amendment. And it involves a challenge by the Catholic Social Services in the context of the City of Philadelphia's uh, foster care program. And so for many, many years, the Catholic Social Services have been screening uh, foster parents in their foster care system. Um, and the, city, and the, the city, city of Philadelphia also has a rule in place there um, that's an anti-discrimination rule. And Catholic Social Services has a policy of, of, of not uh, recommending same-sex couples for foster children. And so in here, the city of Philadelphia says, well, if you don't abide by your anti-discrimination law, then you can't be part of this system. Catholic Social Services says that requirement itself, you know, uh, saying that we have to advance a, a vision that's not consistent with what we think is the right way to look at marriage, that violates the First Amendment's free exercise clause. And so the question is, it's one of these cases where there, you know, there's, it, there's a lot of debate about how do you balance you know, laws that are calling for anti-discrimination principles against the requirements of the First Amendment's free exercise clause. This case could be a blockbuster precisely because the challengers here, the Catholic Social Services, is asking the court to overrule one of the landmark cases in the free exercise clause, effectively saying, we think the free exercise clause should be read as a stronger protection for groups like us, akin to what we see with free speech rights. The court has read those protections fairly narrowly. Here, um, Catholic Social Services is saying, no, 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 you should begin to read them more strongly. But again, it's, 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 it's this balancing act between a, a, a general law of government's passing about anti-discrimination versus the vision of a particular religious group and their religious liberty. It's, a, it's, you know, it's one that, that tends to divide the justices and it's an area of law where there's a lot of, a lot of debate. So that's Fulton. The other one is that this case here, the Mahanoy uh, Area School District versus BL. This is an important school speech case. And the court does not take a lot of school speech cases. So a lot of people are looking at this closely. Um, this case involves that student that you see there, uh, Brandy Levy, BL. BL is there because when this case was filed, I think she was a freshman in high school. So she was a minor, uh, but has since disclosed her name. Uh, is no longer a minor because it takes, a, I think it, it happened in 2017. So it takes a little while for a case to get to the Supreme Court. But she was a freshman. She tried out for the varsity cheerleading team. She was denied uh, a spot on the team. And so she got home. She wasn't happy about it. She got on Snapchat, sent a message to uh, a bunch of her friends. Uh, it involved a, 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 a sort of vulgarity of various sorts, talking about sort of the, the, the school cheerleading squad, et cetera. Um, and, but she did it off campus. Uh, I believe is even on a weekend, um, but she was ultimately suspended from the cheerleading squad by the school for that year. And so she challenged this saying that, no, no, that violates my first amendment rights. And this case is an important case asking how much, you know, to what degree can public schools punish students for what they say off of campus? And one way to look at this is, you know, to what degree does Tinker, the key, the Tinker v. Des Moines School District, the key case about school speech, which gives schools the power in certain circumstances to limit speech in order to avoid material disruption in the classroom. How much does that apply off campus? And so she would say, you know, the student would say, I'm not on campus. This is core speech. I didn't harass anyone. I didn't threaten anyone. So this is protected. Whereas the school district says, no, no we, need a, we need more flexibility than that, not just for a circumstance like this, but for other things like cyberbullying and other threats you may see student to student that we need more flexibility than a, than a rule that just says, no, if you're off campus, you know, we can't reach you. So it's, a, again, a very difficult question. Yeah, and a really interesting one. So again, SCOTUS is in the chat. You can watch these cases come out and definitely have conversations about it because these are fascinating cases. And students, they affect you if you're in a school and using social media, they could affect you as well. So you can find out what your school policy is as well. 
Tom, thank you so much for walking us through how the court works, who's on the courts and what's their job, and then diving into some of the cases that they're hearing right now. It's a really fun class to walk through and then realize how important the courts are every single time a case comes out and what they're deciding around it. So thank you so much. It was a great class and all the students are agreeing. All right. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks, everyone.